be sent over this uh, magic device. Anything that you would like to raise? Please raise up your hand. I'll come over to you with your microphone. Okay. Um, why don't I just leave with one of these questions and let's see if this uh, precipitates other discussion. Uh, yeah. Um, asks um, a question. Where do we draw the line where too many tourists is too much and too little is too little in the context of sustainability? Um, certainly that is a driving issue around over tourism. So I'd be interested to know what either of you might say about what's too much, and what, what is too much and what is too little. I think we, we've touched on it earlier today. Is you've got to look at the sustainability of the area. And if the area cannot handle more tourists, then at some stage you should say no um, and say this is the amount of tourists that we can handle, uh, and not you know improve the airport to bring another two million tourists in when we're already over the sustainability uh, of the area. In, in Bali, for instance, on, on, on the coast, on the west coast uh, of Bali, Kuta Seminyak area, they've run out of water because you know everybody's drilling for water. Now there's no more fresh water, so they're now getting salt water out. And getting salt water out of the aquifer now means that they've got to double up the amount of water they bring out to get fresh water, so it just becomes worse. The destination cannot handle the tourists anymore. And I think for any destination, at some stage, you have to say no and say, this is, this is it. And the, the upside of saying no is that then the destination becomes more exotic because not everybody can go. Then you can, then people will pay more for it because they should know asking the question, will people pay more? If they can't have it, for then they will pay more to, to get it. I think there's an upside to that as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like the fish I talk, talked about, and my, Dr. Walter, you actually touched on that particular part, carrying capacity. So it's very important in the particular ecosystem, even in the in a particular environment to actually understand what is actually the current capacity. So that's why it's very important that, that because there are a lot of policy makers here present. So it's very important that you actually define the master plans for different destinations, especially exotic destinations like let's say Moon National Park. It's very important to understand how many tourists can actually enter that particular park. So 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 likewise, destination wise, country wise, in the master plan designing it's very important to actually have this particular Otherwise, eventually, whatever sustainability that we talk, eventually the particular attraction will actually die off and uh, it will actually impact a lot of livelihoods. It, will, it can have very, uh, very hard impacts. So it's, it's very important. It's certainly true, isn't it, using the water example, that we can measure this and deal with it. Part of it, though, is the, the social uh, care capacity which is much more difficult to determine, right? It's a much more uh, difficult dimension of understanding what is actually the carrying capacity of local residents to tourism. Now we've seen it, what it is, that in Europe, the residents have quite clearly told us what the carrying capacity is, where they're telling the tourists to go home. So we do have measures, but it's different than some of the more technical matters where we're able to measure these. But that's certainly um, evidence is Itself in different ways. Sometimes we can do it technically, scientifically. Otherwise, otherwise it might be the visitor or the tourist that are telling us too many is too many. But there's no magic formula here in that case. So we really need, and I really like the the idea that both of you have been talking about the manager of this. That somebody is responsible for this. That it's not just something a destination says that we're going to be responsible and worry about sourcing but that someone within the destination takes the responsibility to make sure this happens. So I think that was a very strong lesson that I was getting out of today. Um, another question that we have, and this is, I'm not sure whether you'll be able to answer this, either a panelist or people, um, it's anonymous. Um, so I'm not sure who anonymous is, obviously. Is there any integrated framework between UN Habitat, um, UNDWTO, and UNESCO to develop an integrated framework. Now that's, I'm not sure if anyone is aware of, you aware of this. Just to actually do a brief perspective. So if, if, you, if, you, if you see the destination standards, what I have actually presented, 
and whatever the other standards which have acknowledged by the Global Sustainable Tourism Council. So if you look into the requirements, it actually covers these UNWTO aspects in a very elaborated way. So uh, we can actually further discuss because these actually destination certification is actually very complex, very detailed. So it's 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 a, it's a different uh, ball game. So from the uh, from the safety security aspects to uh, crisis management, everything, all these are actually already in line uh, in uh, in the GSTC framework. GSTC endorses other different standards like Indonesian Sustainable Tourism Destination standard is also endorsed by GSTC. Similar standards are available in Thailand. Malaysia, I understand uh, one of the local universities are also developing uh, a sustainable destination framework here. So if it meets the global requirement, GSTC will endorse the particular standard. If they meet the requirements which is actually developed as the UNWTO requirements. So I, I would advise you to actually go to the GSTC website and uh, see the destination criteria which elaborates on how the management setup has to be set in and then how, we, how you have to take care of the uh, empowerment of the local communities to environment and also uh, uh, to uh, reduce the exploitation uh, of uh, uh, various aspects. So it's, it's, it's all well documented. I think it's, it's, a, it's an area that we are also trying to push in Malaysia as well. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to ask you a question. Um, in the second presentation we had, there were indications that overwhelming support for sustainability, for paying more for accommodation or other services that uh, could be certified as sustainable. In your experience in the work that you do, either here in Malaysia or other countries, do you see evidence of that, that the consumer is prepared to pay more for uh, a sustainable product, a sustainable experience? Does anyone want to comment on that? It's a key issue, right? That do we have evidence? Because what we hear often from the industry is they tell us the opposite here in Asia. That it's certainly in not five-star properties, because I think it's fair to say that the consumer in five-star properties is prepared often to, uh, to pay more for a more responsible product. But in that middle three-star uh, world, is there evidence that, that that particular market segment cares about sustainability? And more importantly, would they pay more for a sustainable product? Does anyone want to comment on that in terms of what you experience? Yes, right there in the back. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Umi. Um, I'm working with a travel agency here in Malaysia. And I used to work with a conservation NGO. So um, if you're talking about sustainability in Malaysia, there's not much awareness and education for the public and uh, to pay more is a definitely no. There's always that's the answer that folks get. And um, at the same time when we say sustainability or ecotourism, people will ask um, whether the uh, accommodation or the hotel is really practicing um, Sustainable, uh, sustainable practices, or are they really eco resorts? Because, like for example, um, resorts in the islands. Um, how can you say that you can claim yourself an eco resort uh, in the island? Um, first, how do you build the resort in the island, and uh, second. Do you actually uh, preserve the environment around your place when you build that uh, the resort? Um, for example, you have a resort in the island, but uh, when you die or you bring your customers for snorkeling or diving, you can see corals are dead. 
that probably because how you actually build your your results there, and um, uh, also um, when you say you use um, practice composing um, compose. Yeah, actually, um, you just say it, but just to show your customers that you're uh, you're doing that. But at the end of the day, it's just showing, not practicing. So that's that's what I see from from um, uh, and also experience throughout the years that we're doing uh, the conservation work. Thank you for thank you for sharing that. That's really useful. Does anyone else want? Uh, there's another person. Uh, to add to that. Good evening, thank you very much. My name is Yap, I'm with the Malaysian Association of Hotels. Uh, I can speak on behalf of some of the hotels in, in the country itself. Um, there are hotels and resorts that are banking on sustainable, uh, sustainable practices to, to get more business. And in particular, they do get much more attention from European customers. That, that's, that's a fact. Whereas uh, locals, domestic customers, and Asian customers, they don't really look too much into that. But in general, everyone is talking about sustainability. Um, that's the front end of it. All right. At the back of it, uh, cost is a uh, huge element when you want to go on sustainable practices. Straws, for example. We have hotels going towards paper straws, uh, sugarcane fiber straws, but they are like 10 times more expensive than straws and even plastic effects and whatnot, everything is more expensive. There are hotels and resorts that are willing to embark on it and spend more, but um, whether that that comes to any return on their investment, very subjective, uh, we would like to believe it will, and we would like to believe that it is something that the hotels and resorts are giving back to the environment. So uh, interesting, I'll see if there's anyone else and then I'm going to ask the panelists, but What's really interesting is there is a market segment that you're identifying, which are Europeans, who are much more used to this, that it's much more part of the, the culture, the value system, and yet one could argue that within the Asian context, um, and just back to the earlier commentator, it's really, there's so little awareness about what this means, but especially as we've been identifying it this afternoon, it's not just recycling towels, but much more fundamental changes in the kind of practices that we have. So that's useful, thank you. We have another comment? Yes, Professor, we do have uh, yeah. one more here. Can yeah. we go right to it? He still can run around even yeah. late in the afternoon. Uh, I just want to comment that because I did a research on what that's in back in Kota Kinabalu. Sorry, can you just tell us who you are? My name is Sophia from IDS. Okay. Um, I'm from Kota Kinabalu, Sabah. And I found that when we do a research in the wetlands, I found that actually in China, there are people willing to pay more for, for quality of environment. So actually, I think in China, they are heading to a way that uh, is in a, looking at carbon footprints and sustainability and all, things like that. Okay, it would be interesting to see, again, that profile, whether that's the group traveler or the individual. But thank you for that. That's evidence that you've seen that there is interest and support within the China context. Any other comments about this? Oh, okay, back here, Professor. Right here. Yeah, I don't want to be She's trying to save you. Yes. Thank okay. you. Good afternoon. I'm Neng from the Tourism Promotions Board Philippines. Um, right now, we don't, we cannot really say that there is a um, Truth on the on the what what Miss Booking different said that about five percent uh, tourists are willing to pay five percent more to have a to experience sustainable tourism in a destination. But what I know based on um, my dealings in in overseas trade fairs and travel shows that a lot of Westerners, not only Europeans but also Americans, really in, um, request to include in their itinerary um, an activity to give back to the community which is part of the sustainable thing. 
Thank you. Uh, the Philippines is interesting. Now, uh, the, the Philippines is interesting, uh, where Duarte actually closed Boracay for a while, and so there, there quite clearly is a recognition that there is a tipping point, right? That and in Thailand we see examples of beaches and, and uh, other environments being uh, closed, um, so that there is some recognition of the tipping point, sir. Yeah, I'm Julius from Sabah Tourism Board. Uh, talking about sustainability, for example, like uh, Sabah Park and the Ministry of Tourism, they actually impose, they actually impose uh, carrying capacity on the Sipadan Island. Whereby, per day, you are not allowed to dive uh, 130 bags to maintain the quality and sustainability of the product. The same thing if you want to climb Mount Kinabalu, it actually can to 130, 135 a day to ensure that the product is sustained and probably to comply with the uh, World Heritage requirement. And for another area in, in Sabah, we actually try to develop community-based tourism, whereby we teach the community to actually embrace the concept of eco-tourism. It's not only about profit, but also to conserve the environment and to benefit the local people. And once they understand about this concept, the sustainability mindset uh, will be actually intact and slowly to embrace it so that the environment, the river, they don't simply cut trees in general. So, but it's still very different in terms of awareness of sustainability. Uh, probably uh, uh, BBC, private, public, and community uh, collaboration need to be enhanced to actually push for this initiative. Thanks. Thank you for that. Can I just, uh, can we leave the microphone just there for a second? Just wanted to ask you a question. So these capacities, 135 or whatever it is, how are those determined? There's a mechanism, a formula for uh, especially some part of the definition. Yeah, I'm not really sure how they calculate, but I, I believe there's a formula how they calculate. It would be interesting to see whether they're actually monitoring to see whether these care capacities are really working. In other words, the figures, you know, if you're looking at a baseline, did the 135 actually help to maintain the integrity of the environment? Or whether even in 135, we begin to see deterioration. So it's not just the deterioration, but the nature of the experience that we're trying. But it's interesting that this is actually happening now, where capacities are being identified, and the challenge now is to test them to see whether they're working and how do we better manage them. Thank you. That's very useful. That's a specific piece of information. Any other things? This is really good. Any other experiences or examples that you would like to share with us? about willingness of the consumer to um, pay more, to be much more conscious, to make decisions based on that. I'm gonna ask our two panelists if you might to comment and then hopefully there might be a few more comments from um, uh, the group. Is there, oh, sorry. The lady direct professor. So it, they're doing this on purpose, by the way. They're doing it at the ends of the room to make you walk more and more. Yeah, who is <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Maureen. I'm working with the travel agency. I would like to share about uh, customers willing to pay more. Um, we do have customers, the MITs and JITs. They will tell me that uh, please book me hotels four star and above. So I would say that the trend is increasing. They are willing to pay more for better quality hotels, be FITs or JIT from my side. Thank you. So we're seeing some indication. Any other? Do uh, you want to just comment on this? Yeah, no, I just want to comment sort of in, in, in general of what, what was said. You know, the gentleman over there was you know, talking about straws that become very expensive uh, to buy environmentally friendly straws. My question is why do we need a straw in the first place? You can do with no straws, it costs you nothing. Um, but somewhere or another, you know, way, way back, we were having in, in, in the drinks we had this little umbrella. We got rid of that now. Now we have straws. I've got no idea why, because you don't put straws in wine or in beer or in your whiskey or in your water or in your tea or your coffee, but suddenly there's fruit inside, we need a straw. So it's an easy way to stop, just stop waffling people with straws. Um, interesting about Boracay, what they do now, you cannot go to Boracay now without having a Confirmed booking in a hotel. You cannot go there, but 
just say I'm going to pitch up and you know, find a place. So there's a lot of things you, you, you cannot have a deck chair on the beach anymore. You cannot have a party on the beach. So there's a lot of rules that, uh, that they made for Boracay. It works in that environment. Now, I don't know if it works anywhere else. Sipadon is one of the places where it actually works. They just allow so many people, if you want to dive there, dive there. You can maybe get one dive in a week or two dives in a week there because they, 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 they limit that. Something else that I wanted to touch on when it comes to sustainability, we, we need to distinguish between doing good and doing less bad. Doing less bad is not doing good. It's just doing less bad. So if we reduce our energy, we're doing less bad. If we have zero energy from fossil fuels, we're doing good. There's, there's a distinction in that. So we, we talk about carbon neutral um, properties. If a carbon neutral property don't offset, it's really difficult to do that because you cannot use energy from fossil fuels, otherwise you'll never get there. So it's a very, very interesting thing. And I do believe that people will pay an extra, provided that you have a very strong why. If you have a strong reason and involve creating a property for your destination or your hotel, people will pay more. But when you get to that middle range of, 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 of accommodations, um, watch out for greenwashing because it's always on price. People will do anything. They'll drop, drop their price and put another a couple of stamps on there that's colored green and not really green. Uh, just to speak on behalf of Lonaki because uh, we're in the same group. Uh, so, what uh, book difference uh, studies uh, is actually mainly focusing on the European market? Because it's a European market originated uh, platform which is actually spreading across uh, various layers. So what we see from uh, the studies that we have done is actually not, it's not only the European market, uh, but generally all the developing world, but more important the millennials. So when millennials are actually uh, given the choice to actually select whether you want to actually go for just for relax or likewise, but whether you want to do something good, whether you want to actually do it responsibly, they take the way of responsibility. So there's a growing trend in millennials, so that's why Nautica was also saying the future looks bright. With, with, the, with, the, uh, with the population increase, with the resource uh, requirements, resources are actually being depleted. So it's very important that uh, these things are natural. So this is actually going to be the future. So if you don't pursue in this particular journey, evidently you will actually be kicked out uh, from the market. So in here in Malaysia, there are two green globe certified companies, uh, uh, Club and Sheraton and uh, Manchester Hall Springs. So they communicate the story. End of the day, it's all about branding. How you brand yourself, how you invite people. You are not inviting like uh, papers saying with this uh, particular island that you work in Fiji. So you are not inviting everyone to actually come in. You try to make it exclusive. You try to actually limit, but get valued clients who will actually pay more. So that is where uh, most of the bigger hotels that actually we work with who really emphasize on sustainability and agenda, they want people with conscience coming and staying. So those people are willing to pay more. So that is actually a growing trend in the industry, which is actually happening very fast in Europe, which is also starting to happen in this region. So that's why we, as a service provider who's actually enabling the industry, has also amplified our efforts in the in these markets because even the example of Chinese, so it's not Chinese those days. They have the money, they have the power, and also they have the consciousness. So a lot of things, if you, if you go to China, if you see in market practices then to now, it's a complete change. So it's actually in their culture now. It actually is given to them. So the millennials, especially the next generations which are actually coming in, is with that particular mindset. So this is only going to go up this particular trend. So if we don't adapt now, if we don't set up the, uh, set up the management plans, our management protocols with this now, we will, we will be too late. It can be too late. Uh, then we have to actually get drastic changes like, okay, stopping a particular station to let it recover. That is actually a result of unsustainable management. So without going there, it's better to start as early as possible. Just, just tell you, you, you talk about the hotel in, in, in Fiji. To give you an idea, in 1998, 
Um, we were charging a thousand dollars a night for a 42 square meter room with no air conditioning, and we were full because people came there because of the because of the, the creative the, the, the romantic environment we created. We could charge anything. Once we go, we found out once we went over that seven hundred dollars a night um, fee, it didn't really matter provided you provide service. So people will pay more, but more in the upper upper echelons. Industry. Any reactions to that? What would really be interesting is that you know that if we see this change, that the millennials are going to be much more positive towards sustainable decision making. Um, I think one of the things that would be important in working with the industry is to be able to demonstrate that that we would have the kind of evidence to say that we can show you through the right kind of research that there is a consumer out there that if we can guarantee it's certified that it really is doing what it's meant to do that um that, that there is a market but right now we don't have that data i mean it's anecdotal and i think we really need it because certainly the work we do with hotel owners is that they're very skeptical about this as you were talking about the investment is so significant that that we really need to convince not the operators, but the owners, that is to their advantage from a market point of view to do that. So I think that's one of the things that tourism authorities in each country should start to look at, is to really begin to better understand that consumer. I just to add to uh, that, uh, Dr. Walter, uh, from our experience, because we work with uh, several bigger companies, consumer companies, in, in their procurement policies as well, when they actually go on holidays, for group packages, likewise, they ask us to recommend a sustainable destination for us to actually travel. Because most of these bigger companies, uh, the, the conglomerates, the multinationals, they have their own sustainable policies internally. So this is itself is actually a very big market to tap into these uh, corporate leaders who have sustainability. So in your marketing departments as well, if you have a particular strategy. You can definitely approach these uh, bigger companies saying, okay, we have these uh, particular studies which align with your interest. They are more than happy to actually do those. So we see now the demand from the Asian conglomerates as well, who are requesting from us, hey, we want to go to this place, can you recommend a particular site? So then we ask them, okay, go to book different and actually see who's actually having the highest demand for ratings and then you can compare the prices. So they are willing to pay more, especially the corporates. So now, it's also coming to the groups and uh, the individual travelers. Yeah, I think we, we always want to distinguish between the four or five star internationally owned operated hotels and the large number of locally owned hotels, you know, fragmented ownership, small size. That's a very different challenge, I would argue, right? That, that this, is, this is going to be much more difficult than dealing with the large corporates. As you say, we already have CSR policies and environmental standards and the small ones don't. So I think you know part of our the job that is really as the as the missionaries to really go out and sell this message that there is a business case to be made. So that is why uh, we miss in Book Different as well because uh, people wanted to do but they did not know which which hotels were having strategies and likewise. So that's why uh, Book Different uh, linked with Booking.com database, the entire database, and they added the additional layer of sustainable requirements. So not only the five star, four stars, even the small boutique hotels, and even exclusive uh, hotels likewise, even corporate some destinations, everything. If they are meeting the sustainable requirements, they were given the uh, provisions to actually go there. So if you go to the book different website, you will see different options. You can pay $1,000, even you can pay $100 and actually stay at a, at a better place. So that gives the additional opportunity uh, to even the small scale hotel or hotel and tour operators to do and to, uh, to gain money from the commitments that they are making towards uh, sustainability. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, the responsibility is, is on us as a tourism industry for, for the local um, small hotels, small um, guest houses and what, what they're doing. We're having all these projects of sustainability and all these certifications, um, but in the end, the people that we train, the people that we work for, do they take that that sustainability home? They don't. Um, 
in Bali, we call it, it's another white person project. Um, they don't believe in it because we do it because we're forced to do it, not because we believe in it. And I think it's, it's very important because I think sometimes we hypocrites. We look at the sustainable development um, goals that we have. How many of you are measuring your, your electricity and your water use and your waste at home and have a program at home to make it less? How many are you doing in your office, in your travel agency, in your business? We don't, because we expect somebody else to do it. So if we 60 or 70 odd people out here, if each one of us go back and we practice what we preach, we will show the people around it that, that it's working and that it's worthwhile. Then they can go back and they will, they will be, they will be, they will go preach it to their own house. And we'll see, we see it in, in, in Bali at the moment, is that the younger people are the people that go home and say, hang on, you can't do that anymore. Hang on, you, you, you cannot throw things in the environment. We need to be more, less in energy, hungry. But it depends, it's personal in the end. It's not the government, it's not the company. It's you and it's me. We need to do that. We need to measure our own performance and show people that we're doing it. Then it will work well. Work well. Thank you. Last opportunity. You've been incredibly good. And I really like the participation that we had at the end. Um, one of the challenges that we have, and I just wanted to build up on Piazza, is that we also, those of us who have influence over master plans, of strategic plans, that we really need to start to think about this other dimension, that we just don't put it in our vision statement, but that we make sure that there are programs and that there are our strategies to do this. So I think that's an important lesson out of today, is that those people who are involved in that process actually can do it. I'd like to thank our, our two panelists. I think they've been fantastic in responding to um, uh, your questions and comments. And, and again, just on my behalf as the chair of this particular session, to thank you for being here and participating. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.